Hello class. These, um, this recording for Vaughn will be pretty short. As you notice when you read this Vaughn, this is, um, this is not philosophy, right? Uh, th this is not like the other readings we've been doing. This is how you should write your papers in a philosophy class, okay? So, our other readings are pretty complicated, right? Uh, lots of technical terms, lots of complicated definitions, lots of intricate and detailed arguments that, you know, have examples and metaphors to support them and all sorts of stuff. Those readings are very difficult <clears throat> and um, they require a lot of explanation in the recordings just to get the, the basics straight, right? Uh, they're supposed to be difficult recordings, and that's why I give you lengthy recordings to um, explain those difficult readings. The Vaughn, though, is sort of flipped, right? So the reading is not very difficult. What's going to be difficult, though, is you putting into practice what Vaughn recommends. And I know it's difficult, so that's why I give you support in writing these philosophy papers, various kinds of support uh, for various learning styles and so on. But um, how do I want to say this? Don't be fooled by the easiness of reading Vaughn uh, because he's actually doing sort of what he's recommending that you do. He's writing very clearly, very precisely. He's not being redundant, so he's not repeating the same point uh, uselessly. He's also not leaving anything out. So what that basically means is almost every sentence is Vaughn telling you something that he didn't tell you in the sentence before. So don't just skim this reading. Read it, read it almost like an instruction manual where almost every sentence is a step in a series of instructions that you will at some point need to put into, uh, that you will need to actively do in writing or preparing to write your paper. So I'm not going to explain to you every single sentence because the, the writing itself is very clear. I'm just going to hit some highlights of what I really want you uh, to notice, and I'll give you a little sort of context for, for our class specifically in terms of what he says in general about philosophy papers in general. But I want you always, but I'm repeating it here, I want you always to email me as soon as you have any question. There are no questions too small or too large. Remember as well, since we're an online class, if anything is unclear to you, you can't just <laughs> hope some other student asks the question in class because we're not in class together. And you can't just say, well, I'll, I'll talk to Professor Davidson after class, you know, I don't, you know, because it, it, it's always and never after class, right? So you don't have some of the built-in mechanisms to get your questions answered that we have in normal classes. But on the other hand, because of that, you've got basically a better mechanism built in is that you can, and I expect you to, email me at any moment something's unclear and you'll get a near instant response. You get a quicker response, I predict, than you do emailing a professor in a normal class who's not sort of, you know, I'm sort of living our class online, so I'm at the computer for our class probably more often than most of your professors. So don't let it be a liability that you don't run into me in the hallway, you know, before class. Let it be an advantage that you can email me four in the morning, I don't care, and you'll get a response back as soon as I see that email. Okay. So Vaughn points out, and I've said similar things to you in our um, in the recordings from our earliest days of class, he points out that what a philosophy paper does, and my claim was what philosophy in general does, is that it gives reasons for why something is probably true or not. We've all got opinions, and we've all got feelings. We've all got likes and dislikes. That's just what it means to be human. But this isn't a class in being human. <laughs> you, you don't need to be told how to be human. You're all very good at that. It's a class in philosophy. 
So what philosophy does is it goes beyond just stating what your preference is, or in the case of our authors, they go beyond stating what their preferences is, uh, preferences are. They go beyond saying, I think the death penalty is wrong, or they go beyond saying, um, I think that one must doubt things first and then one can know the truth, right? These would be sort of philosophy-style philosophy claims, right? Okay, and we, we've run into claims like this already in our class. They don't just say what they think is true or what they like and don't like. They always try to give a reason why it makes sense that that thing is true. They basically try to give some form of proof. And I know the word proof seems like an awfully strong word here, so let's just use different words. Philosophers give reasons why they think that what they've said should be convincing to other people. So I'll say that again. Philosophers don't just state what they think is true. They give you, the reader, reasons. That's what I was calling proof. They give you reasons or support that is supposed to be convincing to you and anyone else who can read. Support for what that author thinks. Our papers can be sort of complicated, but at one level, they're very simple. Make me your professor, make the reader of your paper believe what you're saying. Give me, the reader, reasons why what you're saying should be believed. Don't just tell me you believe it. Show me why you believe it. Don't just tell me the author said it was true. The author believes it. Show me the proof, the reasons, the support they gave that were meant to convince anyone who read it. Okay? So really, that's all our papers are, is you are trying to convince the reader that some claim or series of claims, that's what I ask you for in the prompts, okay? you're trying to prove the truth of that or make it more than an opinion, a feeling, but something that's actually convincing, where the reader's going to go, dang, yeah, they, they must be right. That must be correct because these reasons are so strong. So a few things that this is what, it, what, what I mean here. First, this means don't just tell me what the reading said. Don't just tell me uh, Plato says that um, public speakers like lawyers and, and politicians and things like that are like, uh, are like drug dealers or like uh, bakers who just give you whatever feels good, but they're not giving you anything good. Don't just tell me um, Dr. King says so segregation is bad. They said, why? King said, why segregation is bad? Plato and Socrates said, why? Um, they think that politicians and lawyers are peddling, you know, tasty but untrue ideas. Okay. Support was given, and that's what I want the papers to be. It's, you know, it's honestly, it's like 90% of the paper. So, of course, you'll have to tell me what the author said, but that'll be, you know, a sentence or two. And then why that's true, why I should believe it as a reader, that'll be the rest of the paragraph, basically. Okay, so remember, try to convince me, find the reasons that the reading gave, find the reasons and support the authors gave, and show those to me. So linking that up to what Vaughn says, that's basically what Vaughn means in those first few pages of, of this reading I gave you when he says there's a thesis and you're defending the thesis. Okay? A thesis in your paper is your, basically your main claim, your sort of finish line claim, the thing that the whole paper builds up to. Now, a thesis is not a thesis if you just state what the author said. A thesis is not a thesis if you just say what you think. And even a thesis is not a thesis if you just say what you think about what the author said. Add all those things together and add one more thing. The why I always ask you about, the reason why something is true. So even if your thesis were something like, I disagree with Plato or Martin Luther King for this reason, or I agree with him, you'd still always have to say why. That is, you'd have to give a reason why what you're saying is true. 
So all this stuff I said before is my rephrasing of basically what Vaughn means in those first few pages where he says, look, you have to defend a claim, you have to persuade the reader, you have to give support for your views, uh, support what the author said, etc. Okay, and that's just my way of using different words to express the same point. Here is something important, though. It's sort of, it's a slight mismatch between what Vaughn is telling you and what I'm going to tell you. He says, hey, every paper has to have a thesis. Okay, I'm not disputing that exactly, but I just want you to know, for our classes, the way I write the prompts, some of them require a thesis and some don't. Or really, they all more or less have a thesis, but some of them it's clear what the thesis would be, and some of the prompts I'll basically say, hey, do you agree with the author on this specific point or disagree and why? Your statement, I agree for this reason why, or I disagree for that reason why, would be a thesis. Some, though, I, I've got a million reasons to do it, and you can talk to me about those, but I won't go over them here. But some of them, it's not clear which part of it would be the thesis. Um, and so I'm going to just say, do not worry for our class if technically the, the paper you write for me technically has a thesis or not. Okay? I will now tell you in a little more detail what a thesis is, so you because it's important to know for papers in general. By the way, everything I'm saying here is more or less true of every f college essay. I keep saying philosophy this and philosophy that, but it's all more or less true of every college level essay. So that's why I'm going to tell you a bit about what a thesis is, because he is right. Almost every college essay requires a thesis. Okay. A technical thesis, so something that definitely qualifies as a thesis, is this. It is a claim you make in your paper, which is not obviously included in the book you read. So if you had a paper and you thought your thesis was, in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, Hamlet's father was killed. That's not a thesis. Because that's something that's obviously included in that book, that play, Hamlet. Now, if you said, I think that mm, the, the death of Hamlet's father is a symbol for the wars that were happening in Europe at the same time because of uh, this repeated phrase that happens in Shakespeare, I don't know, okay? then that's a thesis. Because you're saying something which is your point, your own point, about the book. It's not just something in the book itself, it's your own point about the book, and that's not quite enough to make it a thesis, you then always have to give a reason why you think that. There's usually a because, or due to this, or since ABC, therefore uh, EFG, in a thesis statement. Now you might be saying, well, professor, why are you telling us this? You're telling me I don't need a thesis, and now you're going on and on about what a thesis is. One, what I said before, you should know what a thesis is because most of your professors will demand you have a thesis. Second, it reveals something about what a college paper is and what our papers in this class need to be, the point I've already made. You have to go beyond describing, summarizing the book, and you have to tell me why it makes sense. You have to make points about it, give proof for it, that isn't just a restatement of what the book says. Convince me of something particular. Don't just tell me every general thing that the book said. Now, you all know that through um, the, the software we use for our course, I can tell when you've looked at things I post. I can tell how many times you look at them. I can tell how long you looked at them. Basically, I know when you're reading and when you're not. And you need to be doing all these readings. Okay. Here's another way that I'm going to be able to tell if you are doing the readings and listening to the recording for this particular thing, for Vaughn. You see at the bottom of 57 where he says how not to begin your philosophy paper? I am in 100% agreement with Vaughn on this. Too many students were taught in high school that when you write something, you have to grab the reader's attention. It makes sense why your teachers taught you that. 
Because if you're going to write something like a letter to your congressperson or uh, an opinion piece for the newspaper, you have to catch your audience's attention. Or else they won't read it and your time was wasted. But I've got a joking way to put this and a more serious way to put this. The joking way is I'm going to read your paper even if it's not interesting. It's my job and I have to do it. I have to give you a grade for your paper. So if your paper is boring and not in, you don't capture my interest in the first few lines, I'm still going to read it and give you the same grade. Okay, so that's the sort of, you know, casual way to put it. Like, hey, I got to read the paper anyways, ha, ha, ha. The more serious point is this. In philosophy, okay, philosophy prides itself on making clear points with exact definitions consistent and logical use of terms and avoiding uh, logical fallacies and other sort of forms of sloppy thinking. So in a word, philosophy prizes itself on clarity, precision, exactness of words. So slamming your hands together in the first intro and saying, since the dawn of time, Everyone has been curious about whether the death penalty is wrong or not. Since the dawn of time, for all human history, people have been arguing about, um, uh, about Plato and Aristotle. No, I mean, those are literally inexact. They're, they're factually inaccurate statements. So if you come out of the gate and rush at me with big flashy language and try to tell me that everyone's most important problem is just what my professor asked me to write on. It's, um, it doesn't seem true. It seems like you're, uh, you're pretending you care about something you don't. You're, it'll lead you to hyperbole or exaggeration. You will overstate and therefore be inaccurate. So go to page 56, the bottom. Well, 56 over to 57 where he talks about the introduction. Oh, by the way, how I can tell if you did this reading and listened to this recording is this, is most people will start out their paper, unless told not to, with since the dawn of time. This author's an idiot. This author's a genius, right? And I don't need those flashy, inaccurate declarations. I need clear, concise, precise, exact language that speaks just to what the prompt asked you for and to nothing else, Okay. So as Vaughn says in 56 and 57, he says, an introduction should tell the reader everything that the paper is going to cover. Okay, don't explain that stuff yet. Just name each main topic for the reader. Tell them what uh, readings you're using. Tell them what the main topics are. Tell them the main points. And then end with something like the thesis. Or if you don't have an official thesis, end with your last final major point. End the, the introduction by telling the person what the payoff of the whole paper is. Your sort of ultimate point, your ultimate conclusion. So here's a little trick of the trade that I do. I use an outline every time I write a paper. The outline is going to include every main point you talk about, every sub point or proof or reason for each major point. It's going to have those in the order in which you write the paper. And your outline is not really going to have anything else. It's like the skeleton for the uh, full body of your paper. So what I do is I use an outline. Then I write the paper. I write the body sections in order. I go back and do revisions, all that. Only when the main part of the paper is done do I write my introduction and conclusion. This is a pro tip for all you who have to write papers. Why would that be? That sounds counterintuitive, right? Why would I write the introduction, the first thing, last? Because a good, clear introduction is going to say, Dear reader, here's my topic. Here's uh, the, the proof the, or the points I will cover discussing that topic. Here's what I'm going to try to claim or prove or argue or defend, the thesis. And here's the reasons why that thesis is true or believable. That's it. So once you've written the paper, you've actually covered all those topics in order. You've strengthened your argument as you go through and write it. So the introduction, this is my point. The introduction should tell the reader every main point you're going to make. 
and then tell them what the final conclusion or thesis is. It shouldn't tell them a whole bunch of other stuff, and it shouldn't leave any of that stuff out. So the way I write my introduction is when I'm all done with the paper, and I reread it and edit it to make sure everything's in there and you know everything's good. Then I just look at the points I made in the order I made them, and that's when I write my introduction. I say, well, paragraph one was about this point. That's your first line of the introduction. Paragraph 2a was about this point, second line of the introduction. The paragraph that follows that, 2b, was about this third point. Okay, that's the third line of the introduction. You see what I mean? You can basically just go through and say, I said this, so I'll say that first in my introduction. Then I said my next point, that's the next point in the introduction. The conclusion you write in much the same way. Although instead of saying, reader, I will tell you this, you say, reader, this is what we went over. Here's why it matters. Here was my final point. You take a bow. Good night. And that's why you don't need to make giant claims about what everyone knows. That's why you don't need to refer to other sources like the dictionary or other books that we're not talking about for our prompt. Just keep it simple. The introduction is merely a summary of what you will discuss. The conclusion is just a summary of what you have discussed. Okay, they shouldn't be a full page long. They should be, you know, five to ten lines, maybe something like that. Okay, maybe five to ten sentences, something like that. Once more, uh, just to be clear, I know this part's a little confusing. Not necessarily every paper topic I give you will have a clear thesis uh, required of it. But everything Vaughn is saying about your thesis there in these pages, you know, 58, 59, okay, is still true about the paper in general. Back up what you're saying, okay, give support for what you're saying, give evidence, prove it to the reader that it's true. Now you see on page 61 going through uh, 64, you've got a very short, very easy to read paper. Uh, very clearly written to give you an example of what a paper should look like. Okay, Please notice the things that happen there in the language. When they introduce a term that not everyone will know, like affluent, they define that term. Affluent means a relatively high level of wealth. Okay, When they make a claim, that is something which can be true or false. That's what a claim means. Something which could be either true or false. Like it's... Uh, there's a moral obligation to help the poor. Now, if it could be true or false, that means not everyone believes it. So what did this high quality paper here do? Every time they made a claim, something that could be true or false, that is something that someone could agree or disagree with, they backed up why it might be true. They didn't just say it. They said, I think X, Y, Z because, and then they give a reason for it. So they define their terms. They tell you why every possibly true or false claim should be considered to be true. There's a logical order to it. They didn't just they didn't start at the end. They didn't start in the middle. They went in a nice logical order. Okay. And they tell you when they're done what all they covered in the conclusion. Okay. So like I said, the Vaughn is a clear writer. Vaughn gave you an example of what a, a, a quality paper might look like that sort of embodies or puts into practice the points Vaughn made. But I bet you still have a lot of questions. I bet some of you are curious what the difference between just stating your view and supporting it is. I bet a lot of you want to know, well, when I say such and such, am I explaining? Am I just paraphrasing? Am I summarizing? Should I add something, right? Okay, those are the kinds of questions that I expect and I welcome. I want those kinds of questions in email. So about Vaughn, about any other day of class, if you have any teeny tiniest question, please absolutely email me, okay? And I will clarify for it. Boom, just send you an instant sort of email right back and you'll get your answer, okay? All right, so that's it for Vaughn. That's my summary. I expect to have questions from you about what a paper should look like once you've done this reading and listen to this recording. So let's, let's have them. Let's have the questions. Thank you, everyone.